Um, good evening and welcome back to the Whalen Library. It's very exciting, Judy. This is our second hybrid program. Um, tonight we are excited to have Judy Bloomberg here to showcase her photography and share her travel insights. Judy's been an intrepid traveler for, traveler for 50 years and has explored well over 100 countries on all seven continents. Whenever possible, she immerses herself in the culture and daily life of the places she visits through homestays, volunteer work, and participation in the celebrations and life cycles events of the inhabitants. Thank you so much again to Judy for being here tonight. I have a couple housekeeping notes. First, I'm recording this session for broadcast on Wakeham, our local cable access channel, and for archiving on the library's YouTube page. So you'll be able to rewatch and share it. And Judy will speak for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. No, I bet I'm going to show photos. Oh, OK. And, and well, then we'll have questions. So we'll have questions after the presentation and the photos. And for those of you who are attending via Zoom, feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time, and then I will read them aloud when we get to the Q&A. And now I will get out of the way and hand it over to Judy. OK. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. I'm Judy Bloomberg. And um, as Courtney said, I am a very intrepid traveler. I've been traveling for over 50 years. I've last count, I've been to about 115 countries. And um, during COVID, I decided to write a book and showcase my travels. And that's, that's what I'm here to share with you tonight. So the program will have two parts. First, I want to talk to you about how my travel experiences have evolved over the last 50 years, how many ways there are to approach travel outside of the typical tourist experience. And then second, I'm going to talk about my book. I've traveled to about 115 countries on every continent. Obviously, I'm not going to discuss every one of them. We couldn't possibly have time. So instead, I focused on some of the least known places, the off the beaten path destinations, and some of the remarkable people that inhabit them. I'll be showing you about 100 of my travel photos, some of which are in the book and some of which are not, and telling you a little bit about the countries they represent and some of the anecdotes of my experiences there. And then finally, at the end, there'll be time for you to ask questions about the book or about my travel experiences in general. So if you have a question about the first part, write it down or put it in the chat so that you don't forget it. I've always had a passion for adventure, not the kind where you climb Mount Everest to prove to yourself in the world that you have amazing endurance and ability to withstand cold but the around the world in 80 days kind of adventure, the kind where you set off for countries whose names you can't even pronounce, to explore other cultures and other peoples, to learn how we are different and perhaps even more importantly, how we are the same. And we'll come back to that, how we are different, how we are the same multiple times. This is my book and I'll talk about it and tell you how you can get it at the end of the talk. So. All right, we're going to start with Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is, I think, one of the most interesting countries in the world. It's a country where there are people in that country who were not known to the outside world and didn't know that there was an, an outside world until about 80 years ago. It's located between Australia and um, and yes, Indonesia. And it was one half of the island of New Guinea is part of Indonesia. The other half, Papua New Guinea, was a colony of Australia for quite a while and became independent in 1975. And it's home to about 800 different languages and as many different tribes, all of which had their own customs, their own dress, their own face paint, and so on. The picture that I'm showing you is a member of the Huli tribe. And that is located, the Huli tribe is in the central 
mountainous highlands of Papua New Guinea. This was the area that was discovered in 1937 by a group of prospectors who were looking for gold and instead found a people that thought they were the only people in the world. And a million of them were living there. One of the things that's interesting about them is that they grow their hair, the men grow their hair and make them into wigs. And this is a man wearing a 36 month wig. He went to a special wig growing school and did special things to his hair. Here are some men at the wig growing school wearing their special red belts that indicate who they are. And they're growing their hair. You can see they look like they have little mushrooms on top of their head. Obviously, this is not a 36 month growth of hair, but they grow 18 month growths of hair as well and make them into everyday wigs. And here's another man in the Huli tribe with his wig and bird of paradise feathers sticking up. And of course, typical face paint. This is a woman who lives in that Huli tribe. And this is a give you an idea of how the women might dress, what their gardens look like, a little bit of their huts off to the side. And another man from the Huli region with a, they don't have bones through their nose. They have cassowary quills that go through their nose. But typical idea of, you know, the native with something pierced through his nose, which is often a rite of passage. This is moving on in Papua New Guinea to the Tufi area. The Tufi area is near the coast. Um, it's a beautiful area. It has great scuba diving. And the people there dress a little bit differently. Here's a man, and this is a young girl in the Tufi tribe. And um, you can see the kind of face paint that she does. These are the Asaro mud men, and we're still in Papua New Guinea. These guys uh, cover their bodies with white clay and make these clay masks, which they would put on to scare off their enemies. The enemies would think that they were spirits and they would run away. Today, I don't think that their enemies think they're spirits, but they still carry on the tradition. This is the Sepik River and this is kind of the mode of transportation, a group of young boys. You can see they really do wear skirts made out of leaves and they're poling their way along the river on a piece of a fallen log. And this is a little bit of the housing that you see in that part of Papua New Guinea. Now we're getting to the Garoka Show. The Garoka Show is a giant festival that happens every September in the town of Garoka. And it's a gathering of perhaps 200 different tribes, each with their own dress, their own facial decoration, their own songs, their own dances and so on. It was actually started, it's not designed as a tourist thing. It was started back in the fifties when the country was still under the rule of Australia and the tribes were constantly fighting with each other. And so what the Australian government decided to do was they would have this big festival and all the tribes could show off their best stuff. And then they would give an award to the one that they thought had the best costumes and the best dances. This was not a good idea because what happened was now the tribes were fighting. Instead of fighting over pigs and women, they were fighting over who got the prize for the best dances. So. They eliminated that idea, but they still hold the festival. Maybe about 200 foreigners come in and thousands and thousands of local people who come and you know, see the performances and so on. And um, it's just done as a, a festival now. So I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly, but you can see some of the different tribes, what they look like, how different they are one from the other. This woman is wearing a, a necklace of bird feathers and you can see how her face is painted. This is actually a woman. To me, it looked like a man, but it's a woman in black face paint. And this is a group of, and I can't tell you what each of these tribes are. There's too many of them, but um, they're putting on a little performance for the rest of the guys. 
these people are wearing face paint, which actually is designed as the flag of Papua New Guinea. So the red on the right and the green with the stars on the left is the flag. And you can see on the right hand side, there's actually a bird of paradise in that red thing because bird of paradise is very important in Papua New Guinea. Here's another guy from the Garoka show. Now, this is a different festival. This is in the area of Simbai, and the tribe is called the Kalam tribe. Simbai is way off the beaten path. If only 200 people who were not Papua New Guineans come to the Garoka show, only about 20 come to the Kalam culture festival, which happens in Simbai. And in order to get there, we had to take MAF, which stands for Missionary Air Fellowship. Those are the planes that fly missionaries out because there's no like commercial flights to go there. So this guy is wearing the traditional headdress of the Kalam tribe. And what's interesting about it is it looks like green beads. It's not green beads, it's beetle shells. There's a particular kind of beetle shell that they gather and they make them into, um, into headdresses. And even the young boys wear headdresses like this. Here's some of the boys at the festival wearing a minimum of clothing. And here's a little, maybe a five-year-old dressed much like the father or like the adult that we saw in the previous picture. One of the things they do at the Callum Cultural show or calm culture festival is they kill a whole lot of pigs. I have to say it's not for the weak of heart because they take clubs and they club the pigs, which is not pleasant, but that's what they do. And then they cut out the intestines and they have a big barbecue essentially. And this woman is, she's pulled out the intestines of the pig and she's gonna make it into sausage. Now we're moving on to Ethiopia which is, in my opinion, my second most interesting country. Ethiopia, for you, those who don't know, is um, in the northeast part of Africa. It's near um, Sudan and Kenya and Eritrea and a whole lot of countries that people don't want to go to. And right now, Ethiopia is a difficult country to go to because there's just a lot of civil war and unrest that happens. It's the only place I ever went where I did notify the um, State Department of my itinerary. Nothing happened, but I was nervous enough about going that I felt I wanted them to know where we were. Think about Ethiopia that's interesting is each part of Ethiopia is different. So in the north, they have Coptic Christians who basically are practicing Christianity as it was practiced in the time of Jesus. I mean, they, it hasn't changed in hundreds of years. So it's not like the Christianity we know in the West. In the East, there's Harar, which is a very Muslim city. And it was, its heyday was in the 12th century when it was one of the most important cities on the trade route, the spice route, um, silk trade uh, between the North and, the, and Africa. And in the South, there are lots of different animist tribes who are living a very, very traditional lifestyle. So it's, it's almost like three different countries. So this is the North and this is the Church of St. George. One of the things that's interesting about Lalibela where this happens in the North is that they have these carved churches that are carved out of rock. And you see them from the top and they're completely different from what you see on the bottom. So on the top, it looks like a cross and it's at ground level. This is what happens to the Church of St. George when you go down into where you enter. And the, the city of Lalabella was built by King Lalabella in the 11th century or 12th century. Uh, because at that time, the, um, 
the Holy Land, Jerusalem, which was very important to him, was in the hands of the infidels. The, you know, the, the Christians could not go to Jerusalem. And so he decided he was going to create a new Jerusalem in Ethiopia, and he built Lalabella. And in fact, they believe that their king, Menelik, was actually the son of Solomon and Queen Sheba. So, you know, they, they see a connection there. This is a group of Coptic Christian priests celebrating Jenna, which is the Ethiopian Christmas. And here's another group of priests also at that same celebration and a group of religious you know, observers at the festival. Now this is Ethiopian um, Epiphany, which happens a little later. It's in this, uh, the city of Addis Ababa, which is the capital. And as I said, they, they think there's this connection with biblical history and so on. And they actually believe that the Ark of the Covenant is located in Ethiopia, that their King Menelik went to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem back to see his father and he came back and he brought the Ark of the Covenant back with him. So they believe it's in this secret place in Aksum, which is a city in Ethiopia. But for Timcot, for Epiphany, these, um, if you see the three guys in the front in the green, the yellow and the orange or red, they're carrying something on their head. That's supposed to symbolize the Ark of the Covenant and they treat it very respectfully. Now this is going to the south of Ethiopia, the area called the Omo, and this is the Nagantum tribe. And you can just get a sense of what the, um, what the face paint, what the body paint and so on look like. Here's another girl from that tribe. That's me with people from the tribe. This is the Hammer tribe, which is also in the south. And you can see this guy's carrying a gun. It's a little hard to see, but um, they do carry guns a lot because it is a pretty unstable country. And that big thing that looks hollowed out, they drink coffee out of that. They actually, it's not coffee as we know it. They use the coffee, the shells of the coffee beans and they make a drink and then they drink it in these big wooden things. This is a woman in the Hammer tribe. And you can see, this is very typical of this tribe. They dye their hair with a mix of ochre and grease or fat. And that's what gives them that color to the hair and also the face. If you notice her face is more bronzy than the rest of her skin, that's, that's the ochre. This is the jumping of the bull ceremony. You can't see the whole thing because, you know, it would be inappropriate. This guy has no clothes on. He, it's a coming of age ceremony. And what they do is they all, the young man, completely nude, he stands in front of the village. They get five cows together, you know, side by side. He climbs up on the first cow. He runs across their backs, gets to the fifth cow, jumps off, and he's a man. So. That is the coming of the bull, uh, the run, sorry, the jumping of the bulls. This is me. We actually stayed overnight in a hammer village with, um, with a family. And at night, I got together with the kids in the village and I taught them English songs like head, shoulders, knees, and toes, and A, B, C, D, E, F, G, <laughs> which they liked. This is one of the most unusual tribes in the Omo, the Mercy tribe. These are the people who, where the women cut their lips, stretch the lip out, and then insert these discs. And the discs can be three inches, five inches, as much as seven inches in diameter. And you know how they manage with that, I don't know, but they do. <laughs> and here's another woman with the stress, uh, the stretched lip, and you can see her headdress with animal horns and she's got the baby just tucked in her, her dress there. Here's another person from the Hammer tribe, just to give you another sense. And this is a group of, of kids who are in the Mercy tribe who are just, they paint their whole bodies, except for one of them, they all are stark naked, but they've got body paint on, so you can't really tell what's there. 
This is me. I was teaching an English class, which I, I try to do that in places where the opportunity presents itself. And so I'll come in and, you know, for an hour, I'll give them a little English class. You can see there's like 50 or 60 kids in there and they're all boys. In Ethiopia, especially in the tribal regions of Ethiopia, girls are not valued in terms of education. Now this is Harar, which I started to talk about that I said is in the East and it's very Muslim. It's a walled city. It still has something like 80 mosques inside it. And this is just a sense of what it looks like in there. And this is me with a hyena. <laughs> this happens in Harar as well. Uh, the man with the stick, his family has been feeding wild hyenas for about 70 years. And they are wild hyenas. They go out during the day. They live out at night. They're not caged. They don't stay in the city. But they've learned over years that they can come to the town at about 9 o'clock at night. And this guy will be there or somebody else in his family to give them something to eat. And so they come. And as long as the guy is there, the hyenas are OK. You know. I, I follow that rule of don't be an early adopter. So I let someone else who was there go first and they didn't get eaten, so then I tried it. This is uh, our trip to Bwindi in Uganda, which is the place where you go to see mountain gorillas, um, which is a very difficult climb. They only give out um, groups of, they give passes to three groups of eight a day, which means a total of 24 people can come, eight people to see each one of three different gorilla groups. And you climb this very difficult climb, and you finally get up there and you just sit for an hour. You can't go up to the gorillas, but they can come to you if they want. And it was a pretty amazing experience. This is Senegal and the Gambia. Senegal and the Gambia are an interesting thing. Originally, it was called Senegambia back in the old days. And then for a while, um, Senegal was part of French West Africa. But the Gambia was not owned by the French. The Gambia was owned by the British. And, but the thing is, the Gambia River is smack in the middle of Senegal. And this was an arrangement that the British and the French came to that the British could have the land for maybe two miles on either side of the Gambia River and the entire rest of it surrounding the Gambia was Senegal. So it's kind of an interesting setup. And this is also, Senegal and the Gambia are the closest places to um, the US. So that's where the vast majority of slaves came from in the days of the slave trade. And you can see this is a sign, a painting on a wall there that kind of highlights that history. This is me and my husband um, at a school in Senegal. And this is what the buses look like in Senegal. Uh, they very brightly colored. Sometimes they have religious things, you know, praise Jesus or whatever. Um, it's very similar to what they have in some other countries in Africa and also in Haiti. They have the same kind of decoration on the buses. Now we're in Morocco, and I love this slide because what it says is 52 days by camel to Timbuktu. For those of us who wanted to know where Timbuktu is, it's in Mali. <laughs> and I don't know how long it would take in a car, but by camel it took 52 days from the very southern point of Morocco, which is called Zagora. This was our guide, Mohammed and he's at the local butcher. That's what the local butcher looks like, buying meat so that we could have a little dinner out in the desert. And here he is preparing some of the dinner. Now we're in Vietnam and I always had a hard time with Vietnam because I'm a, I grew up in the 60s. And to me, Vietnam was a place of war. So it took me a long time to feel like I could go to Vietnam. But once I went there, I really liked it. And this was one of my favorite places in Vietnam. It's a place called Sapa up in the mountains. And it's one of the places where they have the most ethnic tribal groups. Um, they've got the Red Dao and the Black Dao. And these women, uh, you can see they all have similar dress. These are the flower Hmong. 
This is uh, also Vietnam. This is Hoi An, which is a lovely city. Um, you may remember if you followed the news back in, uh, in the 60s. Now we're in Laos. And this is from a market in Laos. It is crickets and grubs. OK? They are for sale as food. Lots of places in, um, lots of places in Asia eat bugs for food. And we tried them. I didn't love them. My husband thought they were pretty good. So to each his own. But they're a great source of protein and we, we may all be eating grubs when the, when the cows and chickens run out. This is a thing called Project Cope in Vientiane, which is the capital of Laos. One thing I didn't realize until I went there was how many bombs we dropped on Laos, we the United States. In the early 1970s, when Vietnam was going on, we dropped something like 2 million bombs on Laos. We dropped more bombs than they dropped in the entire of World War II. And a lot of these things are still there as unexploded ordnance, unfortunately. And so farmer will be plowing in the field or whatever, and he will come across one of these things, and then he'll, um, he'll blow up his legs. Or a kid will find something and think it's a toy and start to play with it and blow themselves up. So they have this whole organization that gives out prosthetic limbs, teaches people how to live normal, relatively normal lives with their prosthetic limbs and so on. Now, I talked earlier about, you know, I want to go to travel to find out how we're different and how we're the same and the how we're the same keeps coming back. So this is in Laos. And these are a couple of monks. A lot of people, girls and boys, become monks in Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar and so on. Not permanently. They'll go, it's, it, sometimes it's a way of getting an education. And they'll go and um, spend several years in a monastery getting their education. But there they are. You can tell it was taken during the time of COVID. And um, just, we came back from our travels two weeks or one week before everything shut down with COVID. So they were already starting to wear masks there. And you can see they've got cell phones. So we're very different and kind of the same too. This is a woman in Northern Thailand in the, uh, the Akha tribe. She's carrying, gathering stuff um, in the woods for cooking and so on. And that's one of my favorite parts of Thailand Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, um, and the areas outside of there have a wonderful variety of ethnic tribal peoples. This is a woman we stayed with. We stayed as guests in her house and um, ate there and they make a, their cooking is they make a fire on the floor in the middle of the floor. How they didn't burn the building down, I don't know. And there, there's her husband. And we actually slept there for one night. <laughs> and then we went to a different one in a different area and slept there for one night. One of the things we did that was very cool in Northern Thailand was we took a Mahout training course at the Thai Elephant Conservation Center. And this is located just outside of Chiang Rai. And what you do is you live Mahouts are elephant trainers. You live with the elephant trainers for two days. They teach you how to ride elephants bareback and they teach you how to bathe them and so on. This is actually, uh, you know, we were walking. There were tourists who came to see us, which is pretty funny. Um, and here we are taking the elephants into the river to bathe them. This is an amazing, this is in Chiang Rai. And I always say, it would, should either be the Sugar Plum Fairy's Palace or the topper for a wedding cake. It's called the White Palace or the White Temple. I'm sorry, the White Temple, but it's pretty, pretty dramatic. It's now we're uh, regular stuff. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, no, it's not, it, it's an actual building. So cement or whatever. Okay, now we're in Myanmar, uh, which used to be called Burma, which is the last 
place we visited before COVID. And this is something called Golden Rock. And Golden Rock is the most important pilgrimage site for Buddhists in all of Myanmar. It, you approach it through this horrible winding mountain road. It takes about 50 minutes to get there. And you, can, you can't go in a car or private transportation. You have to go in this truck with like 50 Burmese people packed into this one truck together. And you get to the top of the mountain and there is this amazing golden structure. And the men, again, men, not women, come and put, they buy pieces of gold leaf and they put it on. So it's got lots and lots and lots of gold leaf on it. And again, um, here's a couple of monks in Myanmar up at the top of the mountain where Golden Rock is. The more we're different, the more we're the same. They've got their cell phones and they're eating their ice cream cones. This is um, the Inlay Lake area of Myanmar. And these are guys bringing lunch to school. They, um, they have one area where they cook the lunch, which I assume is probably mostly rice. And then they walk, you know, half mile down the road, bring it to the local school and serve the kids lunch. This woman is in a restricted area of Myanmar. There are certain areas, and this was before Aung San Suu Kyi got kicked out, and it just before. Um, so there was still a little bit of freedom, but there were areas that were restricted. And you had some areas you couldn't go to at all, some areas you could only go to with special permission that you had to apply and fill out applications. So this was in one of those areas that you could go to with special permission. And this is a woman um, that's referred to as long neck padang. These women wear these uh, gold rings around their necks from the time they're babies. They're very heavy. I tried one on, they probably weigh 40 pounds, um, but they wear them all the time. And again, how are we different? We, wear, we don't wear neck rings. How are we the same? Her kid is wearing an American style watch. She's carrying a cell phone. He's got a t-shirt that I don't know who's on there, but you know, he doesn't look all that foreign. This is um, Mongolia. Mongolia is a huge country and it is about the size physically of France, Germany, Spain, and Poland all put together. It's enormous. It's only got 3 million people in the whole country and a million and a half of them live in the capital, which is called Ulaanbaatar. So the rest of the country is wide open and the people are mostly nomads. We stayed in the capital Ulaanbaatar just long enough to experience the Nadam festival, which is a big festival that's held every year and it's focused on horseback riding and wrestling and archery. But the other thing that's cool is that although the people normally dress in Western style for this festival, they wear traditional dress. And so here's a little girl in traditional dress. Here's a little boy in traditional dress. And here's one of the adults. And this is Western Mongolia. This is my friend Ardak. We stayed in his yurt. And he he's a famous competitive eagle hunter. He's got won many awards. And he took us eagle hunting with his eagle. And this is his yurt. And there were 11 of us who all stayed in the one room yurt together. Here's my husband. He's showing Ardak's kids. He took their picture with an I, on his iPad and he's showing them their picture with the iPad, which they think is pretty cool. This is dung. <laughs> There's lots of yaks, yacht, lots of horses, and this is their means of fuel. They use it for cooking. They use it for heating their house. They just go up in the morning, gather it up, stick it on the pile, and when they need it, they take it. Here's another horseman in Western Mongolia. And there's a bunch of Kazakh ladies getting ready for a wedding. This is an interesting story. Our guide said to us, would you like to go to a Kazakh wedding? We said, sure. We thought we were going to a demonstration of a Kazakh wedding. No. He had a friend who was getting married. He said, I'm guiding these people. Can they come to your wedding? They said, sure. So we found ourselves in a wedding with 300 guests and we were the only ones who were not Kazakh. And 
here we are at the wedding with all our friends. Um, and there was this one guy, the only thing he knew how to say was, okay, thank you. And he would fill your, your cup with vodka. He would bang it out, he'd go, okay, thank you. <laughs> and this was repeated about every 10 minutes. Uh, so we ended up coming back very drunk from that wedding. And this is the vodka of choice, Genghis Khan, Grand Khan, which is Genghis Khan, because they are still very proud of Genghis Khan because that was the time when they were important in the world. This is um, moving on to Bhutan. For those of you who don't know about Bhutan, it's a mountain country between India and China. It was not open to the outside world until like 1970. And you still can't go there without a guide unless you're Indian. This is the Chorton Kora Festival. Um, and, oh, okay. This is the Chorton Kora Festival and it's a bunch of monks and they're doing their, you know, they're praying and so on. This is called a tanka. It's a religious wall hanging that gets unfurled at these festivals. This is one of the dancers. A lot of times they'll put on animal heads and so on when they dance and they act out stories with their dances. This is a couple of kids in the audience, so to speak. And again, how are we different? How are we the same? Take a look at the little um, toy at the bottom of the screen. It's like a little uh, bulldozer or shovel, steam shovel or something. And he is wearing a traditional go, which is the traditional clothing of Bhutan. And all the men have to wear that clothing. It looks like a bathrobe. They have to wear it whenever they're at work, all public things, you know, on their off time, they can wear whatever they want. This is my husband getting hit on the head with a wooden phallus. <laughs> uh, they're very big on fertility in Bhutan. And he, this clown, was obviously telling my husband that he hoped we would have many more children. <laughs> uh, for what it's worth, this was only about five or six years ago. So we were not having any more children. And as I said, they're very big into fertility. So they put these things on the outsides of their houses. Uh, it's exactly what you think it is. And that's supposed to bring not only fertility among human beings, but also fertility in the fields and so on and so forth. This is us at Tiger's Nest, which is a monastery that's about 3000 feet up. And you have to do an extremely arduous climb to get there, but it's worth it for the view. Now we're in Indonesia. This is Komodo Island, which is the only place in the world that you can see Komodo dragons. They're about 10 feet long. A lot of the time they just sit there in the sun and don't bother you, but they can get aggressive. They're very dangerous to animals, but they can kill people too. Um, you, if, you, you know, if you were to cross them. So you can't go anywhere on this island without a ranger with you. Ah, grubs. This was dinner. We went to an island called Flores Island, which is one of the many, many islands of Indonesia. It's actually famous because there's a type of ancient pre-Neanderthal man who was about three feet tall called Homo floriensis that came from this island of Flores. Who knew? But we stayed, again, we've had lots of opportunities to stay with local families who are living these traditional lifestyles. So we stayed with a local family and they took us out hunting for dinner. We went to the bamboo tree, we found bamboo worms and they came, took them home and sauteed them. And these are some of the women in that, uh, that village in Flores. Uh, they're bathing and they're doing their washing in the river. Now we're in India, in Southern India. I've also been to Northern India, but Northern India is more touristy and less interesting, except for the Taj Mahal. So this is a, in the, town, the city of Madurai, which is a relatively small town. It's about a million and a half people, which for India is pretty small for a city. And he is selling um, sugarcane juice. Here's another guy, a shopkeeper in Madurai waiting for customers. And another guy just kind of sitting on the side of the road. And those beautiful, colorful saris. Now, this is the other side. Madurai is on the east in the very far south. 
This is the area called Karala, which is in the far west on the very far south. And the thing you do, it is mostly canals and marshes and swamps. And you can rent these houseboats for two or three days with a private driver and some, you know, staff to take care of you. And they'll take you through the canals so you can see what daily life is like. And this is kind of what daily life is like. People doing their laundry in the river, bathing in the river. Now we moved on. We are in um, Peru. This is Lake Titicaca. And this is the kind of traditional boats that some of the people who live around Lake Titicaca use. And there are these floating islands in the middle of Lake Titicaca that are man-made. They're actually made of like piles and piles of reeds that are anchored to the ground and they build houses on them. And this is a woman with her kids on one of these islands. It's called the Uros Islands. And another woman from Lake Titicaca, the island of Amentani. And this is a woman on the road to Colca Canyon in Peru. And now finally, we've gotten to Antarctica. This is the part of Antarctica that most people who go to Antarctica have seen. It's the peninsula. Most people leave from Ushuaia in Argentina, go to the peninsula, which has not actually been below the Arctic Circle, and come back to Ushuaia. And they see things beautiful, beautiful ice like this. We did something a little different. We left from Argentina. We went halfway around Antarctica and ended up coming back to uh, Bluff, New Zealand. So we got to see a lot of things that people don't typically see when they go to Antarctica. And one of them is we got to see the famous explorer huts. You may remember that Shackleton's famous boat was just discovered a few days ago. This is Shackleton's hut that he lived in in 1909 with his team. And when they were rescued, they left. You know, you have, it's like people leaving out of um, Ukraine. You know, you've got five minutes, take what you can, you're gone. So things were left exactly as they were in 1909. There's the food is still there in the tins. The stockings are drying on the, um, on the line. People's toothbrushes are still there. So it was pretty amazing. And actually um, there is, one thing that was really cool is that Shackleton, there's actually a box there of deliveries that has Shackleton's signature on it where he was signing for supplies. Now, we did not see emperor penguins when we were in Antarctica because they're all offshore, but um, we did go to the Falklands and the Falklands have king penguins. These are king penguins. They look exactly like em emperor penguins, but they're maybe a foot shorter. So these are maybe three and a half feet and the emperor penguins are maybe four and a half feet tall. And that is it. And this is, this is my book again. Um, for those people who might be interested, I do have some of them available, which I will sign if you would like to purchase one tonight. And they are at a price that is discounted about $6 off the Amazon price because this is an author talk. If you can't get it now, or if you're on Zoom, you can contact me at alwaysatraveler2 at gmail.com or check out the Always a Traveler, Never a Tourist page on Facebook. And I will be happy to get you a signed copy um, and tell you how to do that. Or alternatively, you can go to Amazon, of course, and buy one there. So thank you. Now, if there are questions, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. You see with a lot of people in their homes and the tribes, how do you get connected with that? Um, well, we don't do tour groups. That's a given. But that doesn't mean we don't use guides. You know, it would be pretty crazy to go around these places without a guide. And so, you know, I will try and find a guide who is local to that area, who will then know people. And I, I will tell them up front, I would like to stay in a local, with a local family if I can. I would like to teach an English class to the local kids if I can. And usually they'll find a way to do that. Can you 
you jump around so many countries, what about your uh, immunization? Did you get highly vaccinated with all? Like, you know, well, and remember, all? this was before COVID. No, that's um, not COVID. That's yeah, COVID. I've been vaccinated for pretty much everything. Um, you know, vac vaccines last for a long time. It's, yeah. At this point, I don't have to really think about it. I've got all the vaccines yeah. I might need. Sometimes I have to get a prescription for malaria yeah. pills, but that's about it. You referenced having children. Did you do often eat and pass travels with them? No. Uh, they went to camp in the summers, and we did a lot of traveling in the summer. And my children are now 43 and 45. So I've had a pretty good amount of time when they've been off on their own. And, and I kind of went crazy after I retired. I retired about 12 years ago. And then I there was one year, I think it was 2015, that I visited all seven continents in one year. So that was excessive, perhaps. Um, a question from the Zoom? Yes. Um, how did you gain access to some of the very remote areas where outside people don't generally go or aren't allowed to go to? Um, well, if we went there, people are allowed to go by definition. So again, um, I, I rely a lot on things like the TripAdvisor forums. People don't necessarily you know people look at TripAdvisor and see recommendations for hotels and restaurants, but their forums are discussion boards and they're grouped by country. And it's made up almost entirely of adventurous travelers who share information with each other. And they also share recommendations for guides and things like that. And so, you know, I, I, people ask questions and, you know, you, you, you learn things. Uh, you talk, when you travel in this way, you meet other people who travel in this way. We had not had Ethiopia on our to-do list until we were sitting at the airport in Bhutan waiting to leave. And we got talking to the people who were sitting next to us and said, you have to go to Ethiopia. We said, oh, OK. And it was one of the best things we ever did. So um, but you know, the only thing that really was problematic was in Myanmar, where there were things that you had to get permission to, uh, to go to. And, and we just had the place where we were staying you know, fill out the forms and so on. Someone's asking if you've ever been to Easter Island. Yes, I have. And there actually is a picture in my book of uh, the Moai heads, the famous Moai heads in Easter Island. I don't know if people know that Easter Island actually is owned by Chile. Uh, even though the people are generally Polynesian, they are, uh, they are Chilean. Mind, but I don't want to cut anyone off here. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, where are you most looking forward to next? Well, I I pretty much knocked everything off my bucket list. So there's not places that I say like I have to go. Um, there's a few places actually that I might like to go, like the the Silk Road Central Asian countries, some of which you know may or may not happen. Uh, but at this point, we're more revisiting places that we have been in the past. We just came back from, uh, from France a few weeks ago. France is one of my favorite countries. And um, then, uh, oh my goodness, I just realized I missed half of, the, of my presentation. <laughs> Oh, well, would you like to hear more of it? Yeah, I don't know how I missed that. Are you okay with that? Okay. Um, if I've already said this, let me. <laughs> my first foray into travel adventures was over 50 years ago on my honeymoon with my husband, Mark. At the time, the typical way to take a honeymoon was to find the most luxurious Caribbean resort available and to stay there for a week. But a week on the beach just didn't sound like the trip of a lifetime. So instead, we opted for 10 weeks in Europe following the advice in Europe on $5 a day, the budget travel Bible of its day. We had no advance reservations. We just rented a car and headed off to the great chagrin of our parents, who in those days before internet and cell phones, 
had no real way to get in touch with us. We just gave them a general sense of our theoretical itinerary and told them to send us a letter care of the American Express offices in the various cities. And every Sunday we went to the local post office to call home by means of the very cumbersome overseas operator process. In the late 1970s, we stretched our cultural understanding even further by beginning person to person visits. First, we participated in Friendship Force, which was an intercultural city to city exchange program created by Jimmy Carter. Boston was chosen for an exchange with Hamburg and we ended up hosting a lovely German couple in our home for 10 days. With liberal use of a German English dictionary, we got well beyond the typical superficial conversations to discuss serious topics and share real feelings. Our positive experience with Friendship Force led us to get involved with Servas, an organization whose members host each other in their homes for two day periods and to host a Japanese exchange student in our home for six months when our kids were in high school. We still participate in Servas four decades later and have stayed with families all over the world from South Africa to New Zealand, Indonesia, Japan, Italy, and others, as well as hosting many international families here at our home in Sudbury. 1987 was our first real adventure destination. Mark decided that he wanted to go on a cruise. So I started looking at cruise destinations and in the process, I discovered that it was possible to take a cruise to the Amazon. That sounded way more interesting than the Caribbean. We booked passage on a small boat with about 10 or 12 cabins on the Napo River, which was a tributary of the Amazon in Ecuador. Along the way, we became familiar with local tribes, piranhas and 12 inch spiders. We finished the trip off with a visit to the Galapagos before the mainstream tourists had discovered it. And then came Epcot. No, Epcot was not the adventure. Epcot was where we hatched the adventure. We were eating lunch at the restaurant at the French village. I said to Mark, this is so quaint. Wouldn't it be great to live in France? He was supposed to say, that's crazy. We have jobs and lives here in Boston. Instead, he said, okay, sounds good to me. So we quit our jobs, rented a house in a tiny village an hour and a half south of Paris and proceeded to live the year in Provence life, except that this was Burgundy, not Provence. It was 2002. I've always said that that year changed my life and I still measure things as before France and after France. I never imagined that we would become part of a real community in rural France, but we did. I volunteered at the local nursery school once a week and on Fridays, we took long hikes in the forest with my newfound friends from the town. We went to dinner parties at other people's houses and invited our neighbors to dine at our home as well. We attended town-wide soirees, including a New Year's Eve party that lasted until 6 a.m. And of course, we ate at every gourmet French restaurant we could find. We were so glad that we had chosen to live in a small village instead of Paris, because Paris, we would always have been treated like tourists even after a year. But in champigny sur yonne we were accepted as part of the community. When we came home, I had a new skill, fluent French, which I parlayed into a new career as a high school French teacher. But I still wanted to up my game since living in France had allowed me to speak far too much English. I left him home the following summer and went back to France to live with a French family and attend classes with French teachers from Spain, Germany, Holland, Bulgaria, Denmark, and other European countries. We formed a tight knit group as we compared French teaching around the world and even learned to tell what country a person was from by their accent when speaking French. 2008 was the start of another shift in our travel style. We started doing home exchanges where we stayed in the home of a family in another country at the same time that they stayed in our home. So far, we've done about 10 of them to France, Italy, Ireland, Holland, Singapore, and Australia. But the first was actually by far the most interesting of the lot because we stayed in an actual French chateau. We never figured out why people who lived in a chateau would wanna stay at our house, 
but we weren't inclined to complain. The chateau had a grand ballroom. So the owners rented it out for wedding receptions as a side business. On Saturday afternoons, we would come home to find the caterer setting up. We would go to bed to the strains of lively dance music and awake at 7 a.m. to find that the caterers were still there cleaning up. The French definitely like to end their parties late. In recent years, we've added humanitarian volunteer work to the mix, doing good while seeing the world. We've made three trips to Haiti to work with NGOs, visited a remote school in the Gambia, taught English classes in Ethiopia, Indonesia, and Laos, and offered our help to a remarkable com community of Jews in Gondor, Ethiopia. Along the way, I've attended incredible tribal festivals and religious celebrations in places like Papua New Guinea, Ethiopia, Brazil, and Bhutan. I've attended local weddings, coming of age ceremonies, and even a baptism in Papua New Guinea officiated by both a Protestant deacon and a witch doctor. I stayed with local families in their yurts, mud huts, and other traditional accommodations. I've had the privilege of engaging in a lovely conversation with the queen mother of Bhutan, who speaks perfect English when I happened to enter a temple where she had been praying. I've flown over Mount Everest, seen millions of penguins in Antarctica, clawed my way up a mountain in Uganda to spend time with a family of mountain gorillas and even swam in a lake in Ecuador that was filled with piranhas. I think of myself as a citizen of the world. One of the things I find meaningful about travel off the beaten path is that I get to see how people really live and what they really think, not what the American news media tells me that they do and think. It makes me appreciate my life as privilege as an American Every time I think I have something to complain about in my daily life, like stores empty of toilet paper, I think of people I've met in third world countries and I feel very lucky indeed. So thank you for letting me go back and miss that part. I do not know how I missed it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, does it help you more? Sure. Um, when is, have you ever gotten very sick from unusual things you've eaten on your travels? No. The only time I got very sick actually was on my honeymoon in Europe. <laughs> and we were going on $5 a day and staying in cheap hotels. And I got sick from the olive oil. And the doctor said, oh, they send all the, they export all the good olive oil to other countries. You know, you're saying in eating in cheap restaurants, you're eating bad olive oil. But no, I've never gotten sick with other things. Um, and one last question about the children, the picture of you teaching uh, children in Africa. Did they know any English before you? Well, if you looked at the picture, there were words on little signs around the room. I don't think they knew very much. And, you know, there's not very much you can teach them in an hour. I teach them, you know, hi, my name is, how are you? What is your name? How old are you? You know, numbers, things like that. And then I usually teach them a song. But it was not, the, these were not really organized schools. They were village schools where the education was kind of haphazard. Um, and my last question, where are you headed to next? Where would you go back to in a heartbeat? Well, we would go back in a heartbeat to France. Um, in fact, we just came back and we're going again in June. Um, we are headed next to Israel and Jordan. And actually I have been to Israel, but I have never been to Jordan. So that is a new country to add to my list. And I would go back to France. I would go back to Spain. I would go back to Italy. I would go back to Japan. Um, I have been twice to Papua New Guinea, so I did want to go back there. I would go back to Ethiopia. You know, I just think it's fascinating. Um, but we have reached the point in our lives when the older we get, the harder it is to do some of these kinds of trips. So my guess is going forward, we will be spending more time in developed countries than less developed countries. 
Any other questions? Well, I want to say thank you so much to Judy for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to come. I always enjoy sharing my story. And I, I have more. If we had more time, I would share more stories. <laughs> <laughs> That's our money. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you.